So hi everyone, I'm Preeti. Um, I'm in the Department of Computer Science at IIT Bombay. And so today my tutorial is going to be about uh, ASR systems. I'm just going to give a very kind of high level overview of how uh, standard uh, ASR systems work and what are some of the challenges. Um, and hopefully leave you with some uh, open problems and things to think about. So for the uninitiated, so what is an ASR system? Uh, it's one which accurately translates spoken utterances into text. So text can be either in terms of words, so it can be a word sequence, or it can be in terms of syllables, or it can be any subword unit, so phones, uh, or even characters. Uh, but you're translating speech into uh, the, its corresponding textual form. So lots of well-known examples, and most of you must have encountered at least one of these examples. So YouTube's um, closed captioning, so an ASR engine is running and producing the corresponding transcripts for the, the speech, the audio, and the video clips. Then voicemail transcription, even if you've not used it, you might have looked at it and laughed at it because it's usually typically very bad. So the voicemail transcription is also an ASR run engine which is running. Dictation systems were actually one of the older prototypes of ASR systems, and I think now it's obviously gotten much better. But I remember Windows used to come prepackaged with a dictation system. And that used to be pretty good. Um, so dictation systems, of course, you're um, speaking out, and then you automatically get the transcript, the corresponding transcript. So Siri, Cortana, uh, Google Voice Search, all of the front ends are ASR engines, and so on. So this is ASR. But if, so I didn't get a picture for Cortana, I apologize. So this is uh, Siri. But if you were to say, call me a taxi, and Siri responded, from now on, I'll call you taxi, OK? This is not um, the fault of an ASR system. So the ASR system did its job. But there's also a spoken language understanding module to which the ASR will feed into. And so that didn't do its job very well. And so it got the semantics wrong. So this is so people typically tend to collate um, the understanding and the transcription part as, as ASR. But ASR is strictly just translating the spoken utterances into text. So why is um, ASR desirable? And why would you want to build ASR systems for maybe all languages? So obviously, speech is the most natural form of communication. So uh, rather than uh, typing, which is much more cumbersome, you can speak to your devices. And if ASR systems were good, then that kind of solves lots of issues. And it also keeps your uh, hands free which is not always a good thing. So many car companies like Toyota and Honda are, are investing quite a bit to build good speech recognition systems because they want you to be able to drive and talk. Um, I don't know if I entirely recommend it. But uh, so clearly, it leaves um, other modalities open to do other things. Also, uh, another very kind of um, socially desirable aspect of building ASR systems is that now you have interfaces for technology which can be used by both literate and illiterate users. So even users who cannot read or write in a particular language can interact with technology if it is voice driven. And this was uh, so endangered languages, which was a point which uh, Monojit brought up, um, that lots of languages are currently close to extinction and or they've been given this endangered status. So if you have technologies which are built for such languages, it can contribute towards the preservation of such languages. So that's just one kind of nice point of why you would want to invest in um, building ASR systems. So why is ASR a difficult problem? So um, the origins of ASR actually go way back. Uh, it's a real, it's a long-standing problem in AI back in the 50s. So why is it such a difficult problem? And clearly, it's not very difficult for humans to do uh, speech recognition, especially if you're familiar with the language. It's difficult because there are several sources of variability. So one is just your style of speech. So currently, the way I'm speaking, it's kind of semi-spontaneous, but I more or less know what I'm going to say, or at least I'm guided by the points on the slides. And it's certainly continuous speech. So I'm not speaking in any kind of staccato manner, or I'm not saying isolated words. So just the, the style of speech uh, can have a lot to do with um, how ASR systems will perform. And intuitively, isolated words are much more easier for ASR systems than continuous speech. And that's because when you're speaking uh, spontaneously, words are flowing freely into one another. And uh, there are lots of variations which come in due to pronunciations. And um, there's this, there's this um, phenomenon of what's, what's known as co-articulation, 
So it's just that words, your preceding word affects the word which is coming and so on. And so um, because of this kind of smooth characteristic of continuous speech, that actually creates quite a lot of, it's quite challenging for ASR systems to handle it. Of course, nowadays, if you have lots and lots of data, this is not really a problem. But this is one prominent source of variability. Another, of course, is environment. So if you're uh, speaking in very noisy conditions, or if your room acoustics are um, very challenging, for example, it's very reverberant, uh, so you have a lot of echo, or you know, you're speaking in the presence of interfering speakers. So that's actually a real killer. So if you are talking and there's background noise, but the background noise is not you know, like vehicle noise or something which can be easily isolated, but it's actually people talking in the background, that's really hard for um, ASR systems to kind of pick out the voice in the foreground and work on it. So environment is another uh, important source of variability and something which people are very actively working on now to build what are known as robust ASR systems, which are robust to noise. Then, of course, speaker characteristics. So all of us have different ways of speaking. So, of course, accent comes into play. Uh, just your rate of speech. Some people speak faster, some people enunciate more. Um, uh, of course, your age also uh, changes the way, you know, your characteristic of your speech. So the child speech is going to be very different from adult speech. So various characteristics of speakers also, which contribute to uh, making ASR a challenging problem. And of course, there are lots of task-specific constraints. So for example, the number of words in your vocabulary, which you are trying to recognize. Um, so if you're looking at voice search applications, they're looking at million word vocabularies. Um, but if you're looking at a, like a command and control task, where you're only trying to move something um, or your grammar is very, very constrained. There, your vocabulary is much smaller, so that task is simpler. And you might also have language constraints. So maybe you're trying to recognize speech in a language which doesn't have a written form, so it doesn't have transcripts at all. Then what do you do? Or you're working with a language which is very morphologically rich, or it has um, words which have agglutinative properties. So then what do you do with your language models? Maybe n-grams are not good enough. So lots of task-specific constraints also, which contribute to making this a challenging problem. Okay, so um, hopefully I've convinced you that ASR is uh, a quite a challenging problem to work on. So let's kind of just go through uh, the history of ASR. And this is just a sampling. Uh, I'm not going to cover uh, you know, most of the important systems. There's been a lot of work since the 50s. This is actually the 20s, but uh, I'll talk a little about what this is. So the very first kind of ASR, and I'm air quoting because it really isn't doing any recognition of any sort, but it's this uh, charming prototype called Radio Rex. So it's this tiny dog which was, is sitting inside its kennel and is controlled by a spring, which in turn is controlled by an electromagnet. And the electromagnet is sensitive to energies at frequencies around 500 hertz. And 500 hertz happens to be the frequency of the vowel sound E eh in Rex. So when um, someone says Rex, the dog will jump out of the kennel. So this is purely a frequency detector. So it's not, it's not doing any recognition, but it's a very charming prototype. But clearly, I mean, can anyone kind of, there are so many issues with this, right? But uh, with this kind of a system and you're hard coding, okay, it needs to be fire at this 500 Hertz. What is an obvious problem with such a prototype? Noise, yeah, of course. For different people, it might not matter. Yeah, exactly. So this only works for adult men. So it's sexist and it's ageist. It doesn't work on children's speech. It doesn't work on female speech. So yeah, that's obviously an issue when you hard code something. But this is, uh, so this is actually, I recently discovered this is on eBay. And you can... Can I just uh, Yeah. I, I wanted one of these. Oh, really? OK, yeah, yeah, yeah. There was one on sale for... Yes. Uh, and so I started uh, bidding, I actually created my account to bid for this <laughs> thing. And then I noticed the person who kept bidding on top of me was someone who's called Ina Kramansky. Oh, no. Uh, who's a professor at JG, because he wanted one as well. Oh, OK. So, so I, stopped, I stopped bidding and asked him for the video if he gets it. So, <laughs> he, <laughs> so he, he did buy it. He hasn't given me the video, but he did it. Oh, wow, well, OK. OK, so then I can add that to my slide. Yes. That Hidak has this yeah. now. Okay. Hidak has it, yeah. <clears throat> Okay, so that's the very initial prototype, but that's 
single word and it's a frequency detector. So this is not really doing recognition. So the next kind of major system was Shoebox, which was in 1962, and it was by IBM. And they actually demoed the system and it did pretty well. But uh, what it was recognizing was just um, connected uh, strings of digits. So it's just purely a digit recognizer and a few arithmetic operations. So it could do basic arithmetic. You could say 6 plus 5 is and so, and so on. Um, so it, it would perform really well. But of course, this is also very limited. So it's just a total of 16 words, so 10 digits and 6 operations. And it's doing um, isolated word recognition. So actually, uh, sorry, this is not connected speech. You would have to say it uh, with a lot of pause in between each of the individual words. So this was just doing isolated word recognition. And then in the 70s, there was a lot of um, uh, kind of a lot of interest in developing speech recognition systems and AI-based systems. And ARPA, which is this big agency in the US, funded this $3 million project in 1975. And three teams worked on this particular project. And the goal was to build a fairly advanced speech recognition system, which is not just doing some isolated word recognition, and would actually evaluate continuous speech. And so uh, the winning system um, from this particular project was Harpy out of CMU. And uh, Harpy actually was recognizing connected speech from a thousand word vocabulary. So we are slowly making progress. But it, it still didn't use uh, statistical models, which is kind of the current um, setting. And this was um, in the 1980s, uh, kind of pioneered by Fred Yelenik uh, at IBM and uh, others around the same time. Uh, statistical models became very, very popular to be used in speech recognition. And the entire problem was formulated as a noisy channel. And one of the main uh, machine learning paradigms which was used for this particular problem were hidden Markov models. So I'll come to this, uh, not too much in detail, but at least at a high level, I'll refer to this in coming slides. So uh, the statistical models were able to uh, generalize much better than the previous models, because the previous models were all kind of rule-based. And now we are moving into uh, 10K vocabulary sizes. So the vocabulary size is getting larger, and um, these are now kind of falling in what are known as large vocabulary continuous speech recognition systems. Although, of course, now large vocabulary is much larger than 10K. Um, but um, that was in the 80s. And we were in this plateau phase for a long time. And uh, in 2006, um, deep neural networks kind of came to the forefront. And now all the state-of-the-art ASR systems are powered by deep neural network. So all the systems that any of these systems you might have used, uh, Cortana, Siri, Voice Search, they're all uh, at the back end, they're powered by deep neural network based models. So uh, OK, so this is just a video which was actually quite impressive. And this is it happens to be by the CFO of Microsoft, um, Rick Rashid. And this was a really impressive uh, video. So this came out in 2012 um, when Microsoft had completely shifted to deep neural network based models in the back end, I mean, even in, the, in their production models. And this actually, um, so he's speaking. And in real time, the speech recognition system is working and giving transcripts. And you'll see that the quality of the transcriptions is really good. And while the transcriptions were being displayed on the screen, they were also doing uh, translation into Chinese. Um, and so there, there was another screen where they, their empty system, their machine translation system was working and producing real-time uh, Mandarin transcripts. So it was a very impressive demo. And I'm told it was not, uh, maybe uh, Sunaina knows more about the demo itself. And but the University of can... Toronto came together to develop with a, another breakthrough in the field of speech recognition research. The idea that they had was to use a technology in, in a way patterned after the way the human brain works. It's called deep neural networks. And to use that to take in much more data than had previously been able to be used with the hidden Markov models, and use that to significantly improve recognition rates. So that one change, that particular breakthrough, increased recognition rates by approximately 30%. That's a big deal. 
That's the difference between. Okay, so you can see the transcripts are pretty faithful to the speech, and this uh, I'm told was not. Uh, it was actually happening in real time. So that's really impressive. Okay, so given all of this, uh, so you might be wondering what's next. So whenever I tell people I work on speech recognition, I'm asked this question many times. Oh, isn't that problem solved? So what are you doing? What are you continuing to work on? So okay, so just to kind of motivate this question, um, and also kind of related to the topic that our team is working on, which is accent adaptation, um, I'll show you a video of our 12th president of India. So this is uh, Pratibha Patel. So she's sitting in a closed room, and um, she's giving a speech. And this is YouTube's um, uh, automatic captioning system, which is working. So this is, the, this is a really state-of-the-art ASR system. And I got this like a few months back. So let's uh, look at the video. That will define India as a unique country on the world platform. India is also an example of how economic growth can be achieved within a democratic framework. I believe economic growth should translate into the happiness and progress of all. Along with it, there should be development of art and culture, literature and education, science and technology. We have to see how to harness the many resources of India for achieving common good and for inclusive growth. Okay, so uh, the words in red, of course, are the erroneous words. And this is not bad at all. So if you look at this metric, which is you typically used to evaluate ASR systems, so it's the word error rate. So it's just the, if you take this entire word sequence, and you take the true word sequence, um, and you compute uh, an edit distance between these, so just align these two sequences and compute uh, you know, where the words are actually swapped for other words and where certain words are inserted and where, where certain words are deleted, and you get this error rate. And that's 10%, which is fairly respectable. So that's not bad. And that's because uh, the, uh, Google has a very, very uh, well-developed Indian English ASR system. And Google actually calls all of these variants of English different languages. So they have Indian English, Australian English, British English, um, various uh, variants of English. And their system is extremely sophisticated for Indian English. Yeah, it's clean, it's uh, quiet, exactly, yeah. So now let's take speech from our 11th president, who is Abdul Kalam, who, and why I picked him is because he has a more pronounced accent. Um, if any of you, most of you must have heard his speech at some point. Uh, so let's look at how. Battle, which any human being can ever imagine to fight and never stop fighting until you arrive at your destined place, that is the unique you. To get, to, to get the unique you, it's a big battle. The battle means you don't need to take a gun. The battle means you have to have four unique things. Four unique tools you must have in that battle. Uh, one is you have to set the goal. The second one is acquire the knowledge continuously. And third one, it's a hard work with the devotion. And fourth is perseverance. Okay. So I'm actually curious, Alan, how do you think you would have uh, done with recognizing so, this? So we definitely make you know, errors, yeah. Okay? Yeah. because he is much more heavily yes. accented. Yeah. And what's really hard is if you're following the transcript, I'm thinking, <laughs> yeah, that's, that's exactly, exactly what I said. <laughs> so, I mean, well, no, I mean, you have exactly. a language model and not exactly. listening to it, you know, and uh, not seeing the but I, uh, I'm assuming most of us in the room are definitely going to do better than this, right? Uh, definitely better than 39%. Um, so actually, when I, I've shown this video before, and some people from the crowd said, but this is not fair, because not only, I mean, cannot entirely attribute it to accent, because he's in this large room, the, it's more reverberant than the previous video. His um, sentence structure is quite non-standard, like, you know, he moves in and out of various sentences. So this, and of course, Pratibha Patil was reading. Uh, so the, the red speech has a very, very different um, kind of grammatical structure than this, right? So, so I said, okay, let's try to make it fairer, right? So I chose someone who is an American English speaker, but has an accent, because my hypothesis is that accent had a lot to do with uh, this misrecognition, uh, rate getting higher. 
So this is an American English speaker who has a strong accent and has very non-standard word order. And uh, so an obvious choice was Sarah Palin, if you know who she is. Most of you know who Sarah Palin is. Okay. Illegal immigrants welcoming them in, even inducing and seducing them with gift baskets. Come on over the border and here's a gift basket of teddy bears and soccer balls. Our kids and our grandkids, they'll never know then what it is to be rewarded for that entrepreneurial spirit that God creates within us in order to work and to produce and to strive and to thrive and to really be alive. Wisconsin, Reagan saved the hog. Here, you're Harley Davidson. That was Reagan who saved. Okay, so um, if I were to try and predict what the next word is given her word context, there's no way I could reproduce this because it's quite arbitrary, right? You have no idea what she's going to say next. If you showed me that transcription, I would say, well, it's clearly mostly wrong. Nobody would <laughs> actually say that. Yeah, so uh, here clearly language model can only help so much because this is really, it's quite arbitrary. She has a strong accent, but um, uh, YouTube's ASR engines do have a lot of uh, Southern dialects in their training data. Um, so at least the, and she's also speaking to a large crowd in the open. So the acoustic conditions are somewhat similar to the previous video. And the only difference is that the, the speaker in the previous video had a much more pronounced accent. Um, so I'm not saying that it entirely had to do with the degradation in performance, but that certainly was a major factor in why the speech recognition engine didn't do as well. Yes? Second time, it picked up correctly gift basket, but the first time it says with your basket. Is that uh... illegal immigrants welcoming them in, even inducing and seducing them with gift baskets? Come on over the border and. Um, so, so, are you so saying? Like, it could not print for the first time that it's gift and it said your, but the next time it correctly identified. Gifts. Oh, I see, I see. The second, uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, I mean, there are multiple um, things here at play. So maybe after I show the structure of an ASR system, I can come back to this question. Um, any other questions uh, so far? OK. OK, so let's actually um, move into what's the structure of a typical ASR system. So an a this is more or less the pipeline of what's um, uh, typically in an ASR system. So you have. Uh, an acoustic analysis component which sees the speech waveform and converts it into some discrete representation and uh, or features if uh, most of you are familiar with uh, the term features. So the features are then uh, fed into what's known as the acoustic model. Uh, so actually instead of explaining each of these components here, I'll kind of go into each of these individually and explain it more. So the very first component is just looking at the raw speech waveform and converting it into some representation which your algorithms can use. So this is just at a very, very high level. There's a lot of underlying machinery. I'm just giving you an overview of what's going on. So you have the raw speech signal, which uh, then is discretized because you can't really work with this raw speech signal. So you sample it and generate these discrete uh, samples. And each of these samples are typically of the order of um, 10 to 25 milliseconds of speech. And the idea is that once you have each of these, what are known as frames or speech frames, which are roughly around 25, sometimes even larger, um, but typically 25 milliseconds, then you can extract acoustic features which are representative of all the information in your signal. And another uh, reason why you discretize it at particular uh, sampling rates is that the assumption is that within each of these frames, your speech signal is stationary. Um, if your speech signal is not stationary within the uh, speech frames, then there's, there's going to be, uh, you can't effectively extract features from that particular slice. So around 25 milliseconds of speech. So you extract features, and this feature extraction is a very um, involved process, and it requires a lot of uh, signal processing know-how. But this is also kind of motivated by how our ears work. So actually, one of the most 
common acoustic feature representations, which are known as Mel frequency Kepstrel coefficients or MFCCs. They are actually motivated by what goes on in your ear or the filter banks which apply in your ear. So that might be you know, too much detail. So just let's just think of it as follows. So you start with your raw speech waveform. You generate these tiny slices, which are also known as speech frames. And now each speech frame is going to be represented as some real valued vector of features, which is capturing all the information and as far as possible is not redundant. So you don't have different dimensions here, which are redundant. So you want it to be as compact as possible. So now you have these features for each frame. And now these are your inputs to the next component in the ASR system, which is known as the acoustic model. And it's a very important component. So before I go into what an acoustic model is, um, for anyone, probably in this crowd, everyone knows what a phone is, because lots of linguists and many of you might have encountered it. But anyway, so a phone is just a, it's a discrete unit, uh, or it's a speech sound in a language, which can be used to differentiate between words. So um, in ASR, there is uh, this approach, which is known as beads on a string approach. And this is my terrible drawing of beads on a string. But uh, your, the, each word can be uh, represented as a sequence of fonts. So five here is a sequence of three of these speech sounds. So the, the phone alphabet is, is very much like the alphabet for our um, languages, so in text, except now it's, um, it's covering the sound space rather than, your, uh, rather than the textual space. So phones are just the letter, the analogy of phones is letters in your written texts. And each word can be represented as a sequence of phones. So this mapping, if, so you might be wondering, how do you know that five actually maps to this sequence of phones? This is um, written down by experts in the language. So this particular mapping between the pronunciation of a word, so this is actually giving you how this particular word is pronounced, because you know how each individual phone is pronounced. And this pronunciation information is actually given to us by experts. So in English, of course, we have very well-developed pronunciation dictionaries, where experts have given us pronunciations corresponding to most of the commonly occurring words in English. And actually, we have CMU to thank for that. So one of the most uh, popularly used pronunciation dictionaries in English is CMU Dict, which is freely available. And it has around, around 150,000 words, I think, yeah, of that order. Um, and that is actually one of the more, more extensive dictionaries. So typically, uh, you don't get this is not a very easy resource to create, and um, it's, it's clear why, because it's pretty tedious. First of all, you need to find linguistic experts in the language, and then you need to find what are the most commonly occurring words in the language, and so on. Uh, so this takes time, and not many languages have very well-developed pronunciation dictionaries. And most languages have around 20 to 60 phonemes. So the phoneme inventory size is roughly 20 to 60. And this is also something which needs to be determined by experts. What are the phonemes which are applicable to a language? So this is a very language-dependent um, characterization. Like, what, is, what are the phonemes which are relevant to a particular language? OK, so given we have these units, um, OK, so one more, uh, one more slide just to motivate why do we need phones even from a modeling standpoint. So not just from the linguistic standpoint, which is you know, each of these sounds uh, can be kind of discretized in terms of these phones. But even from a modeling standpoint, why are phonemes useful? Why not just use words instead of trying to split it into these subword units? So let's look at a very simple example. So say that your speech waveform is this string of digits, 5419. And say that during training, you've seen lots and lots of samples of 5, 4, and 1. Um, so now you have, you can build models to identify you know, when someone said five, and when someone said four, and when someone said one. But when you come to nine, so this is say during test time, when you're evaluating this particular speech utterance, uh, what do you do then if during training you've never seen nine? Of course, this is not reasonable here because it's a very small vocabulary, but you can extrapolate when you, you know, move to larger vocabularies, right? So yeah, all of these words exist, but what do you do when you come here? What if we were to represent each of these words as their corresponding sequences of phones? 
So now five is you know, this sequence of phonemes, four is this sequence of phonemes, one is this sequence of phonemes, and so on. And now you've seen uh, acoustic speech samples which correspond to each of these phonemes in your training. So during test time, when you see nine, you may, might be able to put together this string of phonemes because you've seen enough acoustic evidence for each of these individual phonemes. Is that um, clear? So it, it helps you generalize just to move to a more fine-grained inventory. But of course, so the, that said, if you have a very limited vocabulary task, and if you're likely to, I mean, it's, say that you know, you're almost certain that during test time, you're only going to get utterances which are going to stick to that particular vocabulary, then, and if you have enough samples during training, you're probably well off just building word level models and not even moving to the phone level. But that is uh, for very limited tasks. So in most tasks, you want to do this. So you want to move to this slightly more fine-grained representation. OK, so that hopefully motivates why we need phonemes. So this is the problem, right? So I, I mentioned you have acoustic features, which you extract from your raw speech signal. And you want, it, you want the output from this acoustic model to be what is a likely phone sequence, which corresponded to this particular speech utterance. So this model is typically, so initially in the 80s and even now, actually, um, hidden Markov models is a paradigm which is used to learn this mapping. So how do I associate uh, a set of frames, a set of uh, features? So when I say frames and features, they are kind of interchangeable, right? So each uh, of these acoustic feature vectors corresponds to a speech frame. So how do I chunk how many frames are going to correspond to a particular phone? And here, so I've shown you a, a, um, a chain of what are known as hidden states in your hidden Markov model. And all the, so this is just like, think of it as a graph. And uh, it's a weighted graph. So here I've not put weights on the arcs. But the weights are all probabilities. So and another thing is here, I've just shown you a single chain that is just a sequence of these phones put together. But you never know that, right? So at each point, you can transition to any phone because you don't know which phone is going to appear next. So the entire model is probabilistic. So you need to have lots of hypotheses as to what the next phone could have been. So here I've obviously simplified it by just showing a single chain. And then you have estimates which say that, okay, I think this initial 10 frames most likely corresponds to a certain phone. And the transition probabilities, the probabilities which transition from one phone state to the other, determine how many you're going to chunk, how many speech frames are going to correspond to each phone. And once in, you're in a particular state, there are probabilities for having generated each of these vectors. So once I'm in, say, this state, there's a probability for having seen this vector given that I'm in this state. And those probabilities come from what are known as Gaussian mixture models. So it's a probability distribution, which determines that, OK, once I'm in this particular state, this particular speech vector could be generated with a certain probability. And how are these probabilities learned from training data? So that is the detail I'm not going to go into. Yeah. Yeah, this is just the, uh, the acoustic vector. That's it, yeah. Uh, so any questions uh, so far? OK, so this is um, I've obviously glossed over lots and lots of details. But this is just to give you a high level idea of you have a probabilistic model which maps sequences of feature vectors to a sequence of phones. OK, so hidden Markov models were the state of the art for a long time. And now, of course, we have deep neural networks which are used for uh, a similar mapping. So now you have your speech signal. And again, you're extracting fixed windows of speech frames. And from these, so say that you're only considering a speech frame here. And then you have, oh, I have a laser pointer. Yeah. So say you're considering a speech frame here. And then you look at a fixed window around it, a fixed window of frames around it. And you generate, put all of these features together. And that is your input to a deep neural network. And the output is what is the most likely phone to have been produced given this particular set of speech frames. 
So, but this is a posterior probability over the phones. Um, so I'm not, I'm not going to go into details about what this is, but again here, you get an estimate of what is the phone given a speech frame. What is the most likely phone? So it's actually a probability distribution over all the phones. And there are two ways in typically, where in, in typically how DNNs are used in acoustic models. So one is, in the previous slide I mentioned, when you have HMMs, you have these states and then you have these probability distributions which uh, govern how the speech vectors correspond to a particular state. And these probability distributions are mixtures of Gaussians. But you could kind of not use mixtures of Gaussians here and instead use probabilities from your DNN. So that is one way in which the DNN and the HMM models can be combined and used within an acoustic model. Uh, so please feel free to stop and ask me any question. So um, at this point, I'm not really clear uh, if I'm going too technical or uh, so please feel free to interrupt at any point. So this is, so the idea is that we, we want to map acoustic features to phone sequences and this is all probabilistic. So we are not giving you a one best sequence. We are saying this is the likely probability distribution of phone sequences. Okay, so that is the output from our acoustic model. Yes. Yeah. Uh, uh, for the HMM, uh, the forms you are the, are the hidden state. Yeah. What are the observations are the acoustic features? Yes. Exactly. The observations are the acoustic features, and then you have probability distributions. How is uh, so the probability distribution for the so you're familiar with HMMs, so you have observation probabilities. So your observation probabilities either they can be Gaussian mixture models or your observation probabilities can be scaled posteriors from your DNNs. <coughs> so it's just the probability distribution, your observation probability distribution can come from the DNN. Yeah. Okay, so this is um, the acoustic model which produces phone sequences. So now we eventually want to get a word sequence, right, from the speech utterance. So this is just an intermediate representation, these phones. So now how do I move from the phones to words? So I mentioned we use these large pronunciation dictionaries. So this is the model which provides a link between these phone sequences and words. So here, typically, just a simple dictionary of pronunciations is maintained. So you have these large dictionaries which say that these words correspond to these sequences of phones. And this is the only module in an ASR system that is not learned. It's not learned from data. So the acoustic model was learned from training data. And we'll come to the language model that is also learned from data. But the pronunciation model is actually expert uh, derived. So an expert gives you these mappings. So I'll talk a little about uh, some work I did during my thesis, which was on pronunciation models. And it, it's kind of um, hinting at how restricted this particular representation is. So I mentioned that each word can be represented as a sequence of phonemes. So we looked at um, a very popular speech corpus called Switchboard, uh, a subset of Switchboard, which is very, very, um, it's annotated at very detailed level. So not only do we have word sequences corresponding to the speech, we also have phonetic sequences. So it's also phonetically transcribed, meaning someone listened to all of the utterances and wrote down the phone sequence the f corresponding to what they heard. And this was obviously done by linguists. And when I say phone, they actually listen to how the word was pronounced, not what the word uh, should have been according to some dictionary. And why I'm saying this is because there's a lot of pronunciation variation when you actually speak, right? So certain words, even though the dictionary says that it should be pronounced a certain way, because of our accents or just because you're talking fast and so on, the word actually ends up being pronounced in an entirely different way. So for some data from this corpus, we actually had phonetic transcriptions which were giving us exactly how people pronounce those words. So if you, one thing that really stands out from the data, so let's look at just four words. So this is probably, sense, everybody, and don't. And the um, uh, row in blue are the phone sequences corresponding to these words according to a dictionary. So this is how the word should be pronounced according to um, an American, um, so this is the American pronunciations. And these were the actual pronunciations from the data. 
as transcribed by a linguist. So obviously, what is the first thing that stands out here? There's no accent. The, yeah, definitely, there is not, there's no one pronunciation corresponding to the word. There are lots of possible pronunciations and you'll also see, um, this is, you'll see lots of like entire syllables are being dropped out of words. Um, so, yeah, I'm speaking very fast. It's wrong, but it's completely legible from the speech. I mean, just because of the context and so on. But they're speaking very fast. Um, so if you actually look at the uh, phonetic transcriptions, there are entire syllables missing. And of course, these are also perfectly legitimate pronunciations, right? So sense, when you say the word, it almost feels like you're inserting a ter uh, at the end, before the last sir sound. Sense. Um, so there are lots of alternate pronunciations for words. And I don't remember the exact number, but I think the average number of pronunciations they found for a word was of the order of four or five. So very far from a single pronunciation for a word. Okay, so we thought, why not? So clearly there's a lot of pronunciation variation. And this was from a corpus which was of conversational speech. So it's not red speech, where people are speaking very fast and so on. Red speech tends to be more clear and they enunciate and they tend to stick more to the dictionary pronunciations. So, but of course you want to recognize conversational speech. Right? You're not always only going to recognize news broadcasters. You need to recognize spontaneous day-to-day -day speech. So how do we kind of uh, try and model this pronunciation variation? How do we computationally model this? And so we thought, why not go to the source? So what is creating these pronunciation variations? So it's your speech production system. So there are various, uh, so before going into that, I'll show you these videos from uh, the SPAN group at USC, which is led by Sri Narayanan. And they do really good work on speech production based models to model pronunciation variation and so on. So this is an MRI of the vocal tract uh, and it's synced with the audio, so. When it comes to singing, I love to sing French art songs. It's probably my favorite type of song to sing. Um, I'm a big fan of Debussy. Um, I mean, I also love operas. I, I love singing Donizetti and Mozart and Strauss. Uh, but when I listen to music, I tend to listen to uh, hard rock or classic rock music. And one of my favorite bands is ACDC. Um, and my favorite song is probably Back in Black, which I'll listen to over and over again in my room. Okay, so you can, so these various uh, parts of the vocal tract which are moving are known as articulators. And the articulators move in various configurations and lead to certain speech sounds being produced. So they did some really cool work on actually These are the movements that shape the speech sounds. Tracking the articulators automatically. Um, this is, which is really cool. So we didn't actually use these, uh, con these, actually these continuous contours. But we said let's discretize the space. So there are these various articulators which move and there are various configurations of these articulators which lead to various speech sounds being produced. So if we can discretize the space and say that, okay, there are eight vocal tract variables and each of these variables can take one of n values, then different value assignments to these tract variables can lead to different sounds. And this didn't just come out of the blues, there's a lot of linguistic, um, analysis on speech production and there are lots of linguist, very well developed linguistic theories on speech production. And we used one of them, which is known as articulatory phonology. So I'll come to that in a, one, in a single slide. So now everybody, which used to be the sequence of phones, can now be represented as these streams of articulatory features. So these, if you have each variable which takes different values, now you'll have these uh, quasi overlapping streams or articulatory features which lead to a particular word and how it's being pronounced. And so why do I say they're overlapping? Because they're not entirely independent, right? So one feature can affect how another feature uh, behaves. So this uh, idea was, so we, we kind of got inspiration from this work on, on this theory called articulatory phonology by Brownman and Goldstein. But they said that this representation of speech as just sequences of phonemes is very, very constrained and it's very restrictive. So let's think of speech as being represented as multiple streams of articulatory movements. 
And that actually gives you a much more elegant framework to represent pronunciation variation. So if, if I had to go back to the previous uh, slide where I showed you all the various pronunciations, to try and kind of motivate how you mm -hmm. went from the dictionary pronunciation of probably to one of these things, it would require kind of deleting three phones, inserting some other phone, like a huge edit distance in terms of phones. So how do you actually motivate such a large deviation in pronunciation? But it turns out that if you represent pronunciations as these streams of features, you can explain pronunciation variation in terms of asynchrony between these feature streams. So just because certain, um, of certain features are not synchronously moving, so you know, certain f you're all, say that you're producing a nasal sound, and in the next, your next sound that you're producing is a bubble, but then there's certain remnants of the nasality which hold on, and so your vowel also becomes a little nasalized, and so on. Um, so there was an example which um, I thought might be, um, may not be entirely, uh, may, may not have time to go into. So the idea is that this articulatory feature uh, framework gives you a, a more elegant, uh, gives you more elegant explanations of pronunciation variation. It's certainly more elegant, but it's very hard to model. And um, we learned that the hard way I did during my thesis. Uh, so we use this representation and we built what is in the olden days, you know, these are called DBNs, which is not deep belief networks, it's dynamic Bayesian networks. So it's the olden day DBN. Um, so it's just a generalization of hidden Markov models. So the hidden Markov model that I described in the acoustic, while I was talking about acoustic models, this is just a, a generalization of that particular paradigm. So you have various variables which represent each of these articulatory features, and then you can represent constraints between these variables and so on. So just by, yeah. But everybody keeps asking, yeah. can you just go over there again? Yeah, yeah, I wish I had that slide, actually. Um, if you don't mind, can I come to this at the end? Because there's a slide which clearly shows. Uh, Yeah. Per, yes. Per, yes. And now it's sort of moving yeah. point. Yes. So now, okay, actually we can take that as an example. So fur. So now I'll say fur. So now I'll break the fur sound into these eight variables and the values it takes. The values it takes to produce the sound fur. So your one to one mapping, right? It's no, it's actually not a one to one mapping. So we left it, we kept it probabilistic. So um, it is mostly one-to-one, -one, but it's not entirely one-to-one. -one. So we did allow for... It's not a one-to-one -one mapping. Yeah, it's not a one-to-one -one mapping. But even if it was... yeah. So actually, if I show you that example slide, I can clearly explain it. So please remind me at the end of the talk. I'd like to show that. Okay, so that was the pronunciation model. And the final model is what's known as the language model, which many of you might actually be quite familiar with. So language model is just saying, so again, the pronunciation model, your output was words. So now you've mapped a phone sequence to a particular word. And now the language model comes in and say, how should these words be ordered according to a particular language? So the language model looks at lots and lots of text in that particular language, and it finds uh, occurrences of words together. And yeah, you have a question. Mm -hmm. So, the first phase was someone speaking, mm -hmm. from that you <coughs> get to these phoneme sequences. Yes. But, so now, now you are coming to this language model, what mm -hmm. about going from the phoneme sequences to words? The pronunciation model. So, this one, right? So the phone sequence, so once I get a phone sequence, I can start mapping chunks of the phones to valid words but in the pronunciation. Yes. Do not correspond to any words. Program. Yes, absolutely. So you could have. Um, so the thing is, you're not getting a single phone sequence, right? So it's probabilistic. So you have probabilities for every phone sequence appearing, and so even if it doesn't exactly match, maybe you will exactly match it with a lower probability. But when the language model also comes in, and then the entire probability, when you add up, then you'll get kind of the most likely sequence. Yeah. Yes. Yes, yeah, they're usually not probabilistic. 
it's deterministic you just have one sequence of typically you just have one sequence of phones which corresponds to a word but it can be probabilistic also yeah exactly the one i was building was too probabilistic there <laughs> are too many probabilities yeah okay so here of course so if you saw the word context the dog obviously the most likely next word to follow this particular word context is ran maybe even can but definitely not pan so um pan would have a very very low probability of following the dog and the language model is also coming to actually related to your question the language model is very crucial because it can be used to disambiguate between similar acoustics so say that your utterance was is the baby crying it could also very well map to this particular word sequence but obviously the first word sequence is much more likely because if you look at large volumes of english text is the baby crying is probably a much more likely um, word ordering than is the baby crying and then let us pray and let us pray so if you have identical acoustic sequences your language model has to kind of come in and do its job well okay so i just want to put this here if if you want to use language models in your work so sri lm so actually alan also mentioned um, about sri in his talk so they've put out this toolkit which is extensively used in many communities so it's known as the sri lm toolkit it has lots of um, inbuilt um, uh, functionalities uh, implemented so this is a good toolkit to use another toolkit which is getting quite popular nowadays is this ken lm toolkit which uh, handles large volumes of text very very efficiently so the um, data structures which they've used to implement this toolkit are much more sophisticated so this is much faster ken lm and but probably only need to use this if you're dealing with very large volumes of data and there's also this open gram and gram library so if you like finite state machines if you like working with finite state machines you want to represent everything as a finite state machine then this is the toolkit for you so open gram and gram uh, it was developed by uh, google okay so language models like i mentioned it has many applications so speech recognition is just one of them machine translation is another application where language models are heavily used handwriting recognition optical character recognition all of these also would use language models on you know either letters or on characters spelling correction again language models are useful here because you can have language models over your character space summarization dialogue generation information retrieval the list is really long so language models are used in a large number of uh, applications so i just want to mention um, this one point about language models so we mentioned that you look at these word contexts and you look at counts of these words in these word contexts over large text corpora in a particular language how often does this particular uh, set of how do, how often do these particular set of words appear and then you compute some relative counts so you see okay this these chunks appear so often and these are the total number of chunks and so you get some relative count so it will give you some probability of how often you can expect this particular chunk to appear so just to kind of slightly formalize that so this very very popular language model which is used are these n gram language models so the, the idea is really straight forward so you just look at uh, co occurring you know either two words or three words or four words um, so if it is your n is 2 then you're looking at bigrams if n is 3 you're looking at trigrams n is 4 4 grams and so on and uh, alan mentioned yesterday the 5 gram mod if you're already looking at 5 grams you know you can pretty much reconstruct english sentences really well uh, but of course then you're running into really really uh, large number of n grams as you include as you increase the order of the n gram so here i'm looking at a 4 gram so the 4 gram is she taught a class so what is the probability of this particular four gram that is the word class follows this particular word context she taught a so you look at counts of she taught a class in large volumes of english text and then you normalize it with the counts of she taught a which is the word context so how often does class come after this particular word context so um, what is the obvious um, limitation here yeah exactly 
So this is, we'll never see enough data. We're always going to run into uh, n-grams, which we are not going to see in the text corpus. And this is actually, this happens far more frequently than one would even expect. I mean, even if you have really, really large databases of n-grams, you're going to run into this issue. So just to make sure that this is true, I went into this Google Books. So Google Books has accumulated lots and lots of n-grams from all the books which are available on Google. This is in English. So you can actually plot how the n-gram, um, how n-grams have appeared in books over some particular time frame. So you can go and play around with this if you've not uh, looked, seen this before. So I just typed in this particular four gram, which hopefully is not very relevant to this crowd. So feeling sleepy right now. Um, and there weren't any valid n-grams at all. And um, this is not a very, very rare four gram, right? And even feeling sleepy, right? None of them appear in text. So this is a problem which occurs actually very, very frequently. So even when you work with these counts from very, very large uh, text corpora, you're always inevitably going to run into this issue, which is you're going to have these unseen n-grams, which never appear in your training data. And wh wh why is this an issue? Because during test time, when you're trying to reorder words according to your particular language model, and if any of these unseen n-grams appear in your test sentence, then the sentence is going to be assigned a probability of zero because it has no idea how to deal with this unseen word. So there is this problem with what are known as unsmoothed n-gram estimates. And I, I wanted to make it a point to actually talk about this because n-grams are only useful with smoothing. So these unsmoothed n-gram estimates, uh, like I mentioned, you'll always run into these unseen n-grams. And then what do you do? So there are a horde of what are known as these smoothing techniques. So you're going to reserve some probability mass from the seen n-grams towards the unseen n-grams. And then there are questions like, how do you distribute that probability mass across the unseen n-grams? And there are various techniques for that as well. Like, how do you distribute that remaining probability mass? So this is, there's kind of a lot, lot of work on smoothing methods. And it's very useful to make n-gram models use, to, to make them effective. So for anyone who's interested, I would highly recommend reading this 1998 paper by Chen and Goodman. Actually, they're at MS, Chen was, Goodman was at uh, MSR. I, I don't know where he is now. Um, so this is an empirical study of smoothing techniques for LMs. It's, I highly recommend this. It's kind of long, but it really gives you a, a very deep understanding of how smoothing techniques help. Um, don't be fooled by the 1998. It's still very relevant today, because n-grams are very relevant even today. Uh, so n-grams are not going anywhere. Um, so I'm not talking about what the latest language models are, but these days in speech recognition systems, we've moved towards these, what are known as recurrent neural network-based language models. Um, so that's neural network-based, but it's, I, I believe it's still not folded into a lot of production systems because it's not very fast. So many of the, uh, production level ASR systems probably still use n-grams and then do a rescoring using recurrent neural network language models. But um, yeah, so n-gram models are still very, very much in, uh, in the picture. Okay, so we've already covered each of these individual components, but there's this big component in the middle, right, which is the decoder. And that's actually a very important component. So I have all of these parts of the ASR system, which are giving me various estimates of you know, what is the most likely phone sequence, what is the most likely word sequence, and so on. But finally, I just want to get the most likely word sequence corresponding to the speech utterance. And so then it's a search problem. So I have these various components. And now I need to search, putting all of them together, I need to search through this entire space. So just um, looking at the very simple example we started with, this is what a naive search graph would look like. So you start at a particular point and say that you only expect it to be nine or one, just these two words. Then you need to transition to nine. So here every single arc doesn't have a weight, but these are all weighted because they all come with their associated probabilities. So you can, from start, you can transition into either producing the word nine or one, but each nine is a sequence of phones and each sequence of, sequence of each phone corresponds to its corresponding HMM, so, and which has its own probabilities. 
So this is already, you can see this is, slight, this is quite a large graph just for these two words. And we are at least, uh, like a half decent system will be looking at at least 20,000 or 40,000 words. So you can imagine how much this search graph blows up. So these are really large search graphs. And um, I think I have another slide. Yeah, so if you had, say, a network of words as follows. So the birds are walking, the boy is walking. This is really simple, right? This is not an n-gram model. This is just, this is highly constrained, right? And so now each of these are now going to map to their corresponding phone sequences. So the, the birds and so on. And each of those phones now are going to correspond to their underlying HMMs. And very quickly, the graph blows up. So if you look at, so just to give you an estimate, uh, a vocabulary size of around 40,000 gives you search graphs of the order of uh, tens of millions of states and arcs. Uh, so these are really large graphs. And so now we need to search through these graphs and throw out what is the most likely word sequence to correspond to the speech utterance. So you might be wondering, how do you, can you do an exact search through this very, very large graph, and the answer is no. You cannot do an exact search through this graph because it's just too large. So you have to resort to approximate search techniques, and there are a bunch of them um, which do a fairly good job. So none of these speech systems that you work with are actually doing an exact search through this graph. OK. So that's the decoder. So any questions so far? So this is the entire kind of pipeline. Um, of how an ASR system works. Okay, so everyone is with me, right? Um, so I want to kind of end with this new direction which is kind of becoming very hot nowadays. And they are known as these end-to-end -end ASR systems. So uh, I showed you all of these different components which put together make up an ASR system. But lots of people are interested in kind of doing away with all of those components. Let's not worry about how a word splits into its corresponding phone sequence. Let's just directly learn a mapping from acoustic features to letters. So this is just to characters. So directly go from uh, speech vectors, so these acoustic vectors, to a character sequence. And then you can have character language models which rescore the character sequence and so on. So this one kind of nice advantage of this is that because you're uh, getting rid of the pronunciation model, which is that you're not now looking at phones at all, you don't need that mapping, the word to phone mapping, which typically is um, written down by experts, and that changes for each language. So now you want to build a new system for a new language. If this worked really well, then all you need is um, speech and the corresponding text. Um, but the catch is you need lots and lots of this for this to work well, for these kinds of end-to-end -end systems to work well. So just for people in the crowd who are interested in these kinds of models, I'll just put down a few references which you can read. So the first is uh, this paper, which came out in 2014, and kind of started off this thread of work, which is this end-to-end -end speech recognition with uh, recurrent neural networks. So I won't go into details at all about the model. Um, this is just for you to jot down if you want to go later and read it up. But I'll put this up, which is, kind of their sample character level transcripts, which they get out of their end-to-end -end systems. So here they have a bunch of target transcriptions and the output transcriptions. So you can immediately see, so this is without any dictionary, without any language model. So this is directly mm -hmm. mapping acoustic vectors to letters, um, characters. So you can see obvious issues like you know, lexical errors. You can see things where you have phonetic similarity, so shingle becomes single. Um, then there are words like Dukakis and uh, Milan, which are apparently not appearing in their vocabulary. So that is another advantage of these character models. So in principle, you don't care about whether you've ever seen this word in your vocabulary, because you're only predicting one character at a time. So it should recover out of vocabulary words, but this system doesn't actually do that too well. Um, it does, yeah. So this is, they just had this without a dictionary, without a language model, but their final numbers are all with um, a language model and a dictionary also, actually. So the second kind of improvement on this paper 
was by Maas et al, who again explored a very, very similar structure as in this previous paper in 2014. And they had this kind of interesting analysis, which I wanted to show. So on the x-axis, you have time. And each of these graphs correspond to various phones. So remember, in their system, there are, there are no phones at all. But they just uh, accumulated a bunch of speech samples, which correspond to each of these phones, and averaged all the character probabilities corresponding to those particular phones. So here, you can see that k obviously comes out, but so does c. So the letter c also corresponds to the cur sound. And interestingly for sh, so this is the phone sh. So S and H, so SH definitely comes out. But so does TI, because as in shun, T-I-O-N. So you would uh, pronounce that as sh, right? So that actually comes out of the data, which is uh, pretty cool. So this, yeah, this was a nice analysis. So um, they do only slightly better than the previous paper. And yeah. So the x-axis is time in frames. You can think of it in speech frames. And these are just the character probabilities. Yeah. So the last system, which came out in 2016 and kind of significantly improved over these two, uses this very popular paradigm now in sequence-to-sequence um, -sequence models, which are known as encoder-decoder networks or sequence-to-sequence -sequence, uh, networks, which was first used for machine translation. And now they applied it to this particular problem and also included what is known as attention. And all of these bells and whistles together definitely make a difference. But um, I want to mention that end-to-end -end systems are not, not yet close to the entire standard pipeline that I showed you earlier. Um, so people would really like to bridge the gap between end-to-end -end systems and this whole pipelines because uh, clearly you know, these are much more, at least easier to understand in some sense, at least from a modeling standpoint, although it's not easier to understand what it's doing. Um, yeah, so there's a lot of work going on in this particular area, but these systems require lots of data, lots and lots of data to train. And that's because not only are you trying to understand what are the underlying speech sounds in the speech utterance, you're also trying to understand spelling. You're trying to figure out what spelling makes sense for a particular utterance. And clearly for a language like English where the orthography is so irregular, uh, it's a hard problem. And so this, these models require large amounts of data to work well. Okay, so I'm gonna come back to this question I posed initially which is what's next. So what are all the kinds of problems that we could work on if anyone was interested in speech recognition? So there are lots of, um, I think there are lots of next steps. So one is you need to do more to make ASR systems robust to kind of variations in age, accent, of course, which is why we are working on that problem. And also this is another thing which people are interested in. So just speech ability. So there are people say with speech impediments, that they stutter or they have other um, issues and they're not able to speak as clearly as maybe all of us in the room. So how can we kind of adapt ASR systems to work well with those people? And this is a real, um, very challenging task. So how do you handle kind of noisy real life settings with many speakers? This goes back to kind of Alan's dream of having a bot which is sitting in a meeting and kind of transcribing and figuring out what is going on. So that would also involve the, AS, the underlying ASR system in that bot. It would have to figure out that, okay, these are all the interfering speakers. This is the main speaker. You know, this is the speaker I need to kind of transcribe. I need to uh, haze out the other interfering speakers and so on. And this is not the state of the art for this, these kinds of meeting speech tasks is not very low. The error rates are not very low. This is actually, um, it's handled pretty well now. If you have lots and lots of labeled speech, this pronunciation variability is actually captured in the acoustic model itself. But handling new languages currently, I mean, the only way to do a good job is to go and collect lots and lots of data, which uh, at least personally to me is unsatisfying 
So it seems like if you have existing models, you should be able to adapt them with not you know, bizarre amounts of labeled speech. At least if they're somewhat related, we should be able to do a, a half decent job by taking existing models and adapting them to the new uh, language that we want to recognize or the new dialect we want to recognize. Um, so th th there are these problems. And I think that so we, in computer science, we're always trying to do things faster and to be more efficient, right? In uh, like both computationally and uh, trying to do things faster from both the computational power standpoint and the memory standpoint. But we should also try to be resource efficient. Right? We don't want to keep going and collecting more and more data every time we come up with a new task. So can we do many of these tasks with less? So can we kind of, this is something that I'm very interested in personally. So can we reduce duplicated effort across domains and languages? And also can we reduce dependence on language specific resources? And this is of course the, the holy grail, I think. Training with less labeled data and actually making use of unsupervised data, um, unlabeled data better. Okay, so I'll, I'll also show this one direction which uh, Microsoft is working on and it's, it's kind of very promising. So this is uh, just an excerpt from an ad. So this is Skype. Can you understand me now, Sean Bin? You can understand me now, you speak Chinese. Yeah, I mean, if that worked as seamlessly as it worked here, that would be pretty cool. So I'm, I'm told this was uh, just set up for the ad. Um, but so uh, Microsoft has been working a lot on speech to speech translation. And I think this is a very interesting problem uh, because speech also can have, there can also be cues in speech which help disambiguate um, utterances in, for the machine translation part and so on. So I think there is something which can be leveraged from the speech, from the speech uh, component, from the ASR component. Uh, so this is something that we talked about a little bit, which was you know, using uh, speech production models and how we can uh, build um, speech production inspired models to handle pronunciation variability. And that actually in principle does reduce dependence on language specific resources. Because all of us have the same vocal tract system, right? So there are only so many ways in which uh, the, our different articulators can form different uh, configurations and produce sounds. So in some sense, mm -hmm. at least in principle, moving to that kind of a model does reduce dependence on language specific resources. So we don't need to come up with phone sets corresponding to a particular language if you're going to represent all of the pronunciations in terms of these articulatory features. But there are other problems with that method. Um, and this is another problem which I think uh, is very interesting. So how do you handle new languages and not have to collect loads and loads of data? So just to tell you how many languages so far have ASR support. So this is actually a year or two old. Maybe this number has gone up a little. So they support roughly around 80 languages. But these languages include Indian English, Australian English, British English, which are not really languages. So that number is even lesser than 80. And if you look at the distribution across continents, um, Europe has the highest representation in terms of languages which are supported by speech technologies. Americas, of course, is small also because they are largely monolingual. Um, but Asia is, is dismal, even though there are so many languages spoken in the Asian subcontinent. So yeah, we should all do more to build uh, speech recognition technologies or language technologies for various uh, langu Indian languages and languages in Asia. And so one thing that you know, we have looked at is, can we try and crowdsource uh, labeled, uh, the labels for speech? So can we just play speech utterances to crowds who speak the particular language and then try to get transcriptions from them? So it will be a little noisy, but then there are techniques to kind of handle the noise in those transcriptions. But that also has an issue because it's somewhat unfair to a large number of languages. So this is um, just the histogram showing, this was all the uh, speakers uh, who are sampled from a large crowdsourcing platform, which is MTurk, uh, Amazon's Mechanical Turk. Mm -hmm. And this looked at the language demographic of crowd workers on Mechanical Turk. Uh, and the yellow bars are actually the speakers of those languages in the world. So you can see there's a large distributional mismatch 
between the language background of the crowd workers and the language expertise which is needed to complete transcription tasks. Mm -hmm. And if you look at, I mean, this tail is really, really long. So forget about minority languages or languages which, you know, it's very, very hard to get native speakers on crowdsourcing platforms. So this also mm -hmm. may not really be a viable solution always. So I think there are lots of interesting problems to think of in that space. Um, so with that, I'm going to stop. I'll kind of leave you with this slide. Uh, yeah, I think I'm doing good on time. So thanks a lot. I'm happy to take more questions. Yes. Yeah. yeah, so lang in language models, you can back off all the way to a unigram model. So as long as each of the individual words you've seen somewhere in the language model, and if your acoustic model is good, so it's going to give you a somewhat reasonable phone sequence corresponding to the underlying speech, you might still recover the word sequence, even though the language model doesn't give you uh, too many constraints. So for example, I think with um, Sarah Palin's speech, the language model, I don't think anything more than maybe a bigram model <laughs> helped, <laughs> or maybe a trigram model at the most. Uh, so as long as the, those in, the individual words have been seen in text, in large volumes of text, and if your acoustic model is good, you can still recover it, even if there is no continuity between the words. Is that, does that answer your question? Yeah. Any other? Okay. Yes. Uh, based on your work in your thesis, uh, yeah. did you ever feel a need to, to have more than 40 points, for example, in English? Mm -hmm. Because I thought it was probabilistic case. Did you ever find some peak somewhere which, you know, which you felt that having more than 40 points was probably better? Oh, would it help to have more than 40 phones? Actually, the, um, so 40 is the number of phonemes. Yeah, but uh, so the number of phones in English is more than 40. So even in that, those phonetic transcriptions, uh, the number of phones were, you know, almost close to 80. Uh, because it's actually annotating all the fine-grained variations. Um, and that, of course, helps uh, if you have that kind of thing, but where are you ever going to get that level of phonetic annotation? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so what is the process of implementing the text feature where the direction apply goes from a particular character? You need other lots, than, uh, other, than than other than lots of labor data. Other than Indian, uh, you also need lots of computational resources. So, but other than that, um, but and I, like I said, it doesn't really work as well as the entire pipeline yet. So there's still a delta in terms of um, the performance of you, the state-of-the-art systems and these end-to-end -end systems. And also, so currently, uh, that you, so they, all these end-to-end -end systems are recurrent neural networks. So there, there is this issue of um, how much context to retain and whether you're retaining that context effectively, which is where these attention mechanisms come in. But attention mechanisms also really fall short. So if you're interested, there is an iClear paper this year, um, which is, I think the title is something like frustratingly short uh, context or something like that. You can search for frustrating. So the idea is that even if you just look at the last five output representations, you can do as well as a really sophisticated attention mechanism. So attention, is all, so attention mechanisms also need to be kind of improved further. Um, yeah. Yeah, so the end-to-end -end system is actually predicting characters. So it predicts a single letter of the alphabet. So out of vocabulary is not an issue at all because it's predicting one character at a time. So it might then work even better for Indian languages. Yeah, so that is so that's actually something that's very interesting. So for Indian languages which are morphologically rich and where you probably cannot um, um, expect to see various uh, forms of a word in the vocabulary. End-to-end um, -end models might actually work really well, but no one has run this yet because this amount of data is not available. Yeah. Uh, in fact, we were looking at this problem, but uh, yeah. for end-to-end -end speech, for example, in English, you have 26 characters to map. There's last right. class, sorry, 26. But in English, I mean, uh, the 
Yeah, yeah, but that's a good mark. English, right? Characters don't really match to sounds. No, not at all. So the, that is so the end-to-end -end system actually needs to the all these problems it needs to learn. It needs to learn the sound mapping. It needs to learn the spelling. Um, so yeah, so there's no it, because it's so irregular, right? The mapping between the characters. So uh, what was the point you were saying, Sunil? So I mean, like for example, in, the, in, in English, it's like 26 classes. Yeah. I mean, that's what you're dealing with. Like, but uh, if I take Hindi, for example, I need to have a class for Sa and C, right? So you, mm -hmm. you have uh, you, you have so many combinations. Of no, you don't need a class for Sa and C. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. So you just. Uh, so you have multi yeah. for every, 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 every No, you might have double of twenty six because you so you have one so just split it um, as like split it according to its Unicode representation. So you would have, if C would just be sir plus e, the E matra. So you would predict sir and then you would predict the matra and you would predict and so on. Um, yeah, so it will be multi, uh, multi label or not a single label. No, it's not multi label. So you just predict How each of these. C in English? S, E, oh. let's say. So you predict S, then E, then Yeah. So here also you predict sir, E. Yeah, yeah. That's, uh, but the label size, of course, the label space becomes larger. But probably just by double. I don't think it will be more than that. Uh, which, if you have enough data, should be okay. Yeah. And I think, yeah, uh, because the, the, like Monojit said, the mapping is much more uh, stable, uh, it actually might do even better than in, in English. Yeah. So what do you think the minimum amount of data is that you need if you want to? Use? Yeah, so I've asked this to like friends at Google and so on. So they use uh, like 10,000 hours of speech. <laughs> All of you must be using. Uh, speech of that order. So, uh, um, so I know the, the standard pipeline, so for switchboard for instance, so switchboard is around 200 hours of speech and the error rates now are um, like 5%, the latest was 5%. Um, so uh, of course with a lot of machinery, so yeah, end to end. What do you think the minimum, bare minimum would be if we really wanted to do this? To try it out? So the other papers that I showed you, they actually work with switchboard, which is 200 hours of speech. So even if you're in the 100 hours and more, I think you can start trying out end-to-end -end systems. But if you're looking at 10 hours, 20 hours, I think. Uh, but I, I would still be interested to see experiments on yeah. Indian languages yeah. with even smaller amounts of data. Some people are doing it on label languages. Right, right. Correct. Yeah, yeah. So it's sort of beginning to work, isn't it? Yeah. Really has to be appropriately similar data. So yes. If it was all, you know, lectures from one person, then maybe. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> That's true. That's true. With the same acoustics. Yeah. Of course. And, yeah. Uh, but you probably need good transcriptions. Uh, but don't underestimate that if you were doing it for Hindi, that it is. No yeah, I think it's. It it. Yeah. That's a very. Uh, I think that'll be a really good experiment to run, even with just ten or twenty hours of yeah. Hindi speech. Uh, how an end-to-end system will perform. Yeah. You had a question? Yeah. Uh, is there evidence of uh, these uh, end-to-end systems performing better for a language with less complicated or No one has done that yet. Not, not just Indian languages, any language. Oh, no. So I, I'm not familiar. Uh, maybe Babel, um, Alan, you have some I'm trying to think about numbers? that. Florian is working on this. And there are, there are, it's not clear. But, you know, the, the argument of doing this for languages with Morphology um, and probably the most one of the most native is Turkish, um, mm. and there are people claiming that you know it's sort of better. It's not clearly better, yet, okay. But this is the hot research topic that people would like to do, and ultimately it would be easier because pronunciation yeah. problem is hard. Yes, yes. <laughs> so if you can sort of get your way around that and find out how <coughs> people actually said it, but don't underestimate. You know, people keep saying this. 26 letters in the English. No, there isn't, because there's numbers and symbols and mm -hmm. other things that you have to address. So. Right. So. Okay. All right. Thanks so much.